Well, the Philharmonic Hall, uh, it looms in our family because my mother worked there as a, as a young woman, as an as a unpaid steward. So she used to talk about going there when she worked for Rushworths in the, in the late 40s. Um, and of course they wanted to train up the people that, that worked there to know a little bit about classical music. What better than that to go and hear an orchestra play, you know? And having such a renowned orchestra in town, I mean, people from my mum's background perhaps didn't, you know, necessarily think right off the bat that they that 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 place was for them. But she, you know, just by sheer luck, really, went ended up selling records. That was the first job she took when she left school at 15. And in those days, you had to know the catalogue, and little by little, she knew about popular music. Obviously, like any young kid would, you know, and. Had, was trained to look through the record catalogues and little by little she was fortunate enough to meet a couple of people in, uh, who, who, who taught her about records, also taught her to appreciate different recordings because records were expensive, you know, and uh, uh, there was a lot of tax on them and everything so they were, had to be handled with care because they were very breakable. So part of the experience of learning about music was to go and, you know, uh, work at the Philharmonic Hall. I, I played the Philharmonic Hall the first time, I believe, in 1984 as a solo singer, or my first solo tour as a professional. Philharmonic Hall was, you know, I mean, it was a, a grander address than most of the places that I'd played up to that point. As a, 1984, my career was only, what, six, seven years in, and we'd mostly played, you know, around the country, dance halls, clubs, town halls, you know, city halls, and, and, and in Liverpool, I think, the first time I played, you know, in Eric's, and so it was quite a step up to go to Philharmonic Hall, and on your own with an acoustic guitar. But of course, playing solo in there is ideal, because it, the acoustic of the venue, because it was made for symphony orchestra, was, uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, used just a little bit of amplification and it carries, you know. Now, of course, I've visited there a few times in different sort of lineups, you know, over the years, you know. Including, of course, really special night with the Philharmonic, you know. I mean, I've, I've worked with the orchestra now. The first time I worked with the orchestra was in London uh, about 1982. And I didn't really know what I was doing, you know. We, we sort of negotiated with the, the, uh, the RPO to do a concert, and I, I, I might as well have been buying ball bearings in a, in a hardware shop for all I knew, you know, about how many musicians you were supposed to have. I just knew that somebody would write the music, you know, the orchestrations, and I would sing. But obviously, as time goes on, I learned a bit more about the, how to write the music down and, and what I wanted to hear. And so by the time I came to work with the uh, Philharmonic, I, I, I had a pretty good book of arrangements. And, you know, we had a, a, a really great night. You know, they played some of the instrumental music I'd written and a group of my songs that were arranged for orchestra, some of them my own arrangements. So it was quite something to stand up there and think about, you know, this, this, uh, the, the continuity of that whole, well, any place you play in really where there's a great orchestra, they've got a lot of history. It's not. You're not putting yourself up on, on the same level as everybody that's ever played with them, but there's something magical to going out there with an orchestra, and you think everything goes into making that tick. You know, the musical directors and artistic directors and conductors that have worked with the orchestra and different notable players that have come through the ranks of that orchestra. You know, uh, it's a lot of history. I play with a lot of different orchestras now, you know, and. I would say that my night with the, I mean, probably a little bit more special because uh, although I wasn't born in Liverpool, my family is from Merseyside and I feel like our home is, our family home is definitely on Merseyside. You know, both my parents and um, grandparents, all from there. And I sort of spent a lot of time as a child in Birkenhead and then went to school for the last two years in Liverpool in 70. So I feel as at home there as anywhere because I haven't lived in England for 25 years, you know. So when I play in Liverpool, it always feels like some sort of homecoming, you know.
you know, I, I just grew up in a house where lots of different music was appreciated because my family were involved in music and therefore it didn't s seem as if one kind of music belonged to one generation and a different kind of music to another gen generation. My, my parents were both curious about all music. I truthfully didn't know anything about rock and roll when I was a small child because my parents didn't listen to it. They listened to jazz predominantly and my father sang on in a dance hall and on the radio singing popular music of the day which gradually became yeah. beat music so it was sort of the second time around rock and roll that I caught on to it but then you know I, I wouldn't have been pretty young when the original rock and roll first hit so the music that I heard as a very small child tended to be ballad singers of course all of that was most of that music was orchestrally accompanied so the sound of orchestra even if it was on popular records was something that was familiar and you know, welcoming to me. Actually, my first ever visit to the Philharmonic Hall was not to see the orchestra. It was actually to see the scaffold supported by Deaf School, uh, which was quite a bizarre concert, actually. Um, I have to say though, I loved it, and uh, even then, at the age of whatever I was, 16, I was impressed by the venue. And still to this day, I actually have a rose pressed in an atlas that was thrown off stage by Betty Bright from Deaf School. Um, so that was the first time I ever went. And to be perfectly honest, for some considerable time after that, my connection with the Philharmonic was largely actually down to my love of the Deco building and its sort of majestic minimality. Um, it's only in later life that I actually started to go to the classical concerts with the orchestra. So um, I approached it from a sort of architectural angle, first of all, which I don't know how many people have done that. Without sounding too egotistical, probably my favorite concert experience was actually being on the stage. Um, it, was t it was intimidating. I mean, you have to remember that Paul Humphreys and I, from Orchestral Moves in the Dark, both got booted out of the recorder group at junior school where, at the age of 10, 10 years old because we actually were unable to play. We couldn't read music and we couldn't play our recorders because we spent all of our time actually going playing football and we never rehearsed. Both of us used to sit on tables of girls miming and hoping that the teacher wouldn't ask us to play a solo piece. When they did, we got booted out. So um, you could imagine how terrifying it was for the two of us after all these years of winging it and learning everything by ear um, to stand in front of 75 classically trained musicians who bless them were not at all elitist because I did think that there might be quite a lot of them who thought that soiling their instruments with our minimal nonsense would be below, beneath them um, but they were wonderful and um, it was just an incredible incredible experience nerve-wracking we because we can't read or write music we have to commit everything to memory so we are accustomed when learning something new to have to spend a vast amount of time actually just ramming it into the memory whereas of course the orchestra out of necessity can't spend forever rehearsing uh, their time is very precious and valuable so i was really amazed at how little rehearsal they need to do that the ability to sight read um, is incredible so after months and months of preparation and transcribing and arranging the songs that actually there was only two two rehearsals one the day before which I had to attend on my own because Paul Humphreys was in Los Angeles one on the afternoon of the concert and then we did the concert so I think the orchestra were completely comfortable with it. Again, it just added to the terror that Paul and I were feeling because we'd hardly had rehearsal. Um, it was an amazing experience. It made me realize that rock and roll music has, basically only has two volumes, loud and really bloody loud. Uh, the dynamics of an orchestra I had never experienced before. I'm so used to everything being compressed um, and having an orchestra in my in-ears that was not compressed was quite disturbing because I could hear myself clearly but sometimes I couldn't hear them because they were so quiet and sometimes I couldn't hear myself because they were so loud and they weren't being 
sort of controlled by the compression that I'm so used to. So that was quite a, an amazing experience. Also, having to restrict my idiosyncratic dancing style uh, for fear of clattering into some expensive violins right behind me was a little bit intimidating. Um, but the whole experience was just, it was a series of firsts and it was just wonderful. So we really utilised the orchestra, which meant completely deconstructing our songs and starting again. So it was quite fascinating to, to see the audiences sort of, so it's like, you know, guess that tune, how far into the song they go, oh, I know, I know what this is, because the introductions could often be quite interesting and, and, and different. So I could go on for hours about how wonderful that experience was. It's not egotistical, it was just powerful. You know, there's an argument that almost by definition, there's going to be an element of a niche audience, whether you call it elitist or whatever, because not everybody goes to classical concerts. But they really shouldn't be that intimidated by them. And I think that's one of the strengths of the, uh, the, the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra recently, is that they've started to really make themselves popular. Without dumbing it down, they're reaching out, they're making people start to see that they can be part of this incredibly beautiful music that perhaps they didn't think would really resonate in their lives. And I think that's, that's been a real great positive. I am infamous and renowned for using my mantra being subtlety is the art of not coming to the point. So you will be unsurprised that my favorite concert ever is Carmina Barana. <laughs> um, closely followed by Holt's Planets. And I, I suppose, you know, many people would say, oh, he's picking the popular classics here. But, you know, there's a reason why they're popular. They reach out to people and they touch people. Um, so I would say that probably the, uh, uh, Holtz Planets and Carmina Burana. Um, I particularly liked the end of the planets when the choir was actually in the room at the back of the stage and they got quieter by slowly closing the door. I just thought that was a beautiful genius touch. It was like, we don't have to get quiet, we'll just close the door. Um, and he wanted a third one. Uh, well, purely, actually, a pure soft spot. I used to attend Christmas concerts with my father. The only classical music my father could abide was Strauss waltzes. So the Strauss Gala evenings, for me, are a personal recollection of my father who passed away 10 years ago.